Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm really happy to in welcome you to this session on experts in the midst. I'm Frances de Sterk, a Fed Honorary Advisor, and for my sins, I was a trustee for many years, um, of, formerly of the RCM and the International Confederation of Midwives. And of course, a member of the Jamaican diaspora in the UK. So what about experts in the midst? Well, this report focuses on NHS staff who identify as being a member of a diaspora. Our focus at SET's focus is mainly, but not exclusively, first generation members of diaspora. And as this report is written by THET, we bring a particular focus on diaspora engagement in health partnerships and what this means for their countries uh, of origin or of heritage, as well as the NHS. So why was this done? And as I listened to uh, Professor Marla Rao this morning, and she talked about the twin tsunamis that hit us this year, about the COVID pandemic and you know, the killing of George Floyd, I thought that was very timely in its work. Well, the intention was to highlight an era that had not been systematically explored before, and that's the contribution that diaspora staff make to the NHS and to global health. And it's the partnerships between the UK and low and middle income countries. And I want to pay and acknowledge um, that's former um, head of policy and learning Graham Chisholm who actually wrote the report. So how did we go about it? Well, with the guidance of wisdom and knowledge of an expert eminent steering group, we did an in-house rapid literature review and it showed that this area had not been systematically explored before. And then the University of Westminster did a scoping review of evidence both published and gray. Again, similar thing had not been explored before. So who? Then we did semi-structured interviews, and these were conducted with about 12 key informants from a range of organizations, academia, public sector, civil society, NHS, and so on. And then there was a public inquiry it was held to explore the broader context of the engagement of UK health and social care professionals. And we heard evidence from, again, a range of witnesses from across professional organizations, international NGOs, academia, diaspora health groups, etc. Um, and bodies of the NHS. And finally, we did a survey of about 227 health partnerships um, that that had funded both in the past and currently. So that's the background to the report. And I was absolutely very delighted to be asked to chair the steering committee as a outgoing trustee of that. So today we have a panel of four eminent speakers two of whom are members of the steering committee. The first one is Susanna Ejan, who's an international independent global consultant. And she used to work with it many years ago, and she's now at Harvard doing a master's in some grand thing. And second member of the steering committee is Sir Errol, um, Sir Sabaratnam Arul Kumaran, known to many as Arul, and he's a former president of the RCOG and FIGO, and he's now Emeritus Professor of St. George's University. We have Jackie Dunk, Professor Jackie Dunkley Bent, who is a first Chief Midwifery Officer um, ever, a National Maternity Service Champion for NHS England and NHS Improvement. And last but not least, Mumtaz Patel, who will be speaking um, on behalf of Health Education England who sponsored the report, although she wasn't actually a member of the report. And she's a postgrad associate dean for Health Education England in the Northwest. So in the options, I want to kick off by asking, and I'm sorry about my voice, but I've got this dreadful throat. I want to ask um, Arul and Susanna, Arul first, could you just share your impressions of what you think the most important themes are of this report? Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for kindly inviting me for this uh, meeting. I made a few points which I would like to talk on. TET's unique position at the Center of Health Partnership Community allows TET to harness and coordinate expertise from across the NHS and the UK health systems. So the diaspora NHS staff have competencies that are valuable to strengthen global health system 
which includes the NHS. Health partnerships underpinned by reciprocal exchange of knowledge, skills, and experience is very much wanted to provide the best patient care. 15% of staff in the NHS, that is one in seven, are from the diaspora group. This report highlights that there has been an increase in 60% of additional activity recently by the diaspora in the respective heritage countries. For global health systems to thrive and prosper, we should engage, enable, empower, and train the diaspora members to compete and take leadership positions. The issue of leadership is intrinsically linked to inclusion and the sense of belonging. So that's quite important that if you ask somebody, do you belong to the NHS or the UK, then they should be able to say yes. And that comes with the issue of leadership and inclusion. The NHS staff is diverse but not inclusive. We should strive hard from early student days for all members of the diverse community to be inclusive so that they develop a sense of belonging to the same community. We can work out a program like in Wales and Scotland to reduce and eliminate the unconscious bias which leads to persistent racism. We are glad to report that the NHS England, NHS Improvement and Higher Education England are working towards such a great, such a goal. And many professional royal colleges, including the RCOG and universities are taking the same path so that we can examine and maximize the potential of the diaspora to work in the NHS and also in the heritage country. They should feel they belong to the NHS in the UK and are able to help the countries of their origin. From the inception, the NHS has depended on diaspora. Currently, significant number of NHS staff are from the diaspora community. Despite training and working in the NHS, there's proportionately less entry, entry into specialty training, number of candidates who pass the exams, the number of candidates who advance in their career, but yet more are reported to disciplinary action to the General Medical Council. And not only about the diaspora members, but also about the patients. Patient outcome also different. With three to five times higher maternal mortality in the Afro-Caribbean community compared to the whites. This may be partly due to social, economic, and genetic factors, but not entirely, as shown by the detailed analysis of direct versus indirect maternal deaths. So this phenomenon might be partly linked to culture, communication, and beliefs. We believe that the diaspora who are trained in the heritage countries working with the local staff might help to resolve the problem by producing guidelines, especially for those conditions which are met in the, that community, diaspora community in the UK. As indicated by the third report, the contribution by the members of the diaspora to the countries of their heritage in economic terms, cultural exchange, knowledge transfer, and research is significant. So the NHS and the UK government should encourage diaspora's work in their countries of origin by special leave, funding, and recognition. The human and social capital will benefit the NHS, the UK, and the diaspora countries. So truly, the report, as it reads, has given great contribution to global health. I would like us to remember the contributions made by the diaspora to the NHS. One in three doctors, one in seven nurses, and significant other NHS staff are from the diaspora community. Their devoted work for the NHS was clearly shown during the COVID pandemic, despite the risk to their own lives. Their devoted service to the country of origin was highlighted in the third report by examples like East London with Uganda on mental health and Anesthesia Global, which has benefited not only the respective countries, but also the NHS. Involvement in diaspora exchange improves the knowledge on tropical diseases. It improves communication, teamwork, patient experience, and how to manage patients with respect and dignity based on their culture. Diaspora-led or diaspora-inclusive group engagement in global health is a hidden contribution. The report highlights the maternal health, 
health workforce issues, mental health, NCDs, and improvement in universal health coverage. In addition, there are other health disciplines which have benefited by the work. So THET has contributed to improvement in clinical competency, management, and leadership skills, and thus improve patient experience. This has been despite challenges and constraints, including workforce issues. Elimination of race discrimination and more collaboration will promote more health promotion programs and better health systems in a number of countries. I welcome this report and support its recommendations, which we will discuss later. And the MFS and heritage countries have benefited by the diaspora group, and we should promote and sustain it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arul. And I want to move immediately on to Susanna to share her impressions of the report. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you, Frances, and thank you, Arul, for such a great introduction. I am really so glad um, to finally have this report. Um, I think it's a really important milestone. I used to work with Ted um, a long time ago uh, in the in 2004 for the for four years in 2008 and and diaspora working with diasporas and working with people from low and middle income countries in the health sector in the uk was central to to the core of what that was doing um and now with this report is um somehow a way of solidifying that, those those years of work and all that experience. And it is amazing how they have put together the report because they also, they have not only um, uh, consulted with uh, uh, partnerships engaged with, with TED, but also with other partnerships that are not necessarily engaged or benefited, benefiting from TED's grants. Um, so really the, the, the report and the, and the findings and the learnings that are, that are here are really, are really rich and really important, and um, and highlights uh, the contribution of the of the UK diaspora groups uh, to global healthcare and also to uh, healthcare in their countries of origins and in other countries as well. To me, the the two the two main themes um, that I would like to highlight are, as Arul has mentioned, is the the the, the case studies, the case studies because the, there is a body of evidence you know there is um, there is a lot of information a lot of, uh, of things that are, are going on that are worth unpacking even more yes um so there is, this is not something uh new um uh, there, there are some of those partnerships which are more systematic uh which are working with different sources of funding and, and you can see by the type of examples and activities that they engage with but this is also a good way of showing that we can we can do more and how on how people can engage more uh, when they when they can be appropriately supported so i think this is linked to the recommendations that there is a there is a good opportunity here to 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 contribute to um, the strengthening of the values of the NHS, but not only that, to to, to global health needs, and, and and you know we all we all benefit. The second the second part I would like to to highlight is um, is table one in the report, uh, which which talks about the different benefits of the of the of engagement in, in partnerships and how the diaspora contributes so they talk about um, clinical skills management communication and teamwork patient experience and dignity policy development academic skills personal satisfaction and interest uh, you know like this is beautiful this is broad this says something about the richness of being engaged in partnerships and why in health partnerships and why people do it um, particularly people who um, have many other commitments but still are committed to to these partnerships and we have seen them as a as, as useful that for the retention of, of staff eh? uh, as well I, I remember that was one of the the, the reasons uh, many people highlight continuing in um, to be engaged in, in a working in a hospital to be because they were really uh, uh, invested in this in this relationship and they were getting a lot of things out of the of the partnerships so um, I think with those two main issues and and the the contribution 
of of, of these examples to, to global healthcare, to the, U, the, to the UK's global health diplomacy effort and to the UK's global health effort. Um, I think uh, it should be, it should be um, well, well welcome, yes, uh, everywhere. I hope that everyone has read the report and that if not, you have not read it, that you will read it. And that is really used as a tool for advocacy to, to, to um, and engaging with all decision makers because uh, it is important that we don't lose momentum, that, that partner, health partnerships are supported, uh, continuously supported, that uh, and that this work can advance. Um, it has been great and we can really uh, make it stronger by, by building on the recommendations of the report. Thank you, Frances. Thank you very much, Susanna. And before I go over to Professor Jackie Dante Bent, I just want to highlight a point that Arul made and a point that you made. And Arul talked about the NHS being diverse but not inclusive. And I think that's one of the, the um, key points of the report about inclusion being fundamental. And Susanna, you talked about the commitment of the diaspora and then being engaged and invested in partnerships, relationships. And I think we need to recognize that that does exist and how can we make sure that we enhance that. I'm going to go over to you now, Jackie, could you <coughs> share with us what you think are the key points of the report? Thank you, Francis, and um, a great opportunity to be able to contribute to this significant um, event. Um, I, I read the report and it was quite sobering reading for me, um, to be candid. Sobering reading in terms of uh, some of the findings uh, and some of the challenges that we face today, and also the significant um, and the significance of the uh, recommendations of the report, also heartened by the robust methodology that was undertaken to develop and deliver on a report such as this. And just mirroring what colleagues have said, there is nothing better than a story, a case study to bring the data and, um, and the literature to life um, because every number obscures a human experience. So um, without rehearsing what other colleagues have said, they're my headlines, a very sobering, significant read, robust methodology, fantastic case studies and recommendations that I know we're going to discuss. I think without a doubt, single-handedly, we all are aware of the significant contribution that the diaspora make to healthcare provision. And uh, without rehearsing this too much, um, we've heard it before, that in order for us to collectively provide fantastic health care and have the outcomes that we can have, improved outcomes and experiences, our staff need to be cared for, respected and valued. And I know this is integral to some of the findings of the report. So I look forward um, with expectancy and with excitement um, for when this, well, this report has landed, but how we're going to progress with next steps because we can't have more literature. We now need demonstrable action that's felt within the hearts and minds of those that are providing health care and indeed in the hearts and minds of those who are receiving the care that we provide. Thank, thank you very much for that, Jackie. Um, now, if anyone wants to ask a question, please do. But while you're thinking about a question, I'm going to move over to explore the recommendations. And just to bring to the overarching um, feel of the recommendations is that about enabling, engaging, and empowering. That's what we need to do. And I'm going to invite um, Mumtaz now to share her thoughts first about the report and then go straight into the recommendations. Over to you, Mumtaz. Thank you so much, Francis, and um, thank you so much for inviting me and being part of this great panel and discussion. So the report in itself is fantastic. A lot of the things that um, have been written is not the first time we've heard it. And I guess my thoughts on this would be, you know, what can we do next and how can we take forward the recommendations? 
Um, I've been involved on kind of um, a wider level with a lot of the EDI agen agenda over the years and differential attainment and Professor Ma um, Mala Rao discussed some of those things in the past. So with our international workforce, it's how do we better support? How do we better engage? And as um, Francis was just saying, the key diaspora recommendations are around enabling engagement and empowering. And I think those are the key themes. And in order to take those things forwards, I think the key principles are around inclusion. So we talk about diversity being valued, which is, you know, should be done anyway. But in order to take that forwards, inclusion and belongingness is the key principles of how we make that effective. And value, I think we all want to be valued um, as individuals, as human beings, but also the contributions that are made um, and not be treated as a number, because I think that's what happens sometimes, particularly with the international medical workforce in the roles that I do, um, particularly, um, you know, kind of seen as a, as a gap filler, as we call it, sometimes in supporting rotor management, but they're all individuals and how they are better, um, you know, kind of in, uh, improving the healthcare which is provided, how we can better support them to engage them into kind of further positions is important. So I think key principles, as I say, around inclusion, belongingness, value, working in partnership to support and instilling that bi-directional learning. So it's not about, you know, kind of one imparting knowledge to another. It's how can we learn from others? And we do a lot of welcome to UK practice, but it's just there's so much to learn from different cultures. And surely we should be better sort of supporting individuals to learn both ways. So from the Health Education England side, as um, Francis, you mentioned, this was uh, the whole report and the work was supported from Health Education England. Our main sort of work that we do is supporting and delivery of high, patient, high quality patient care through roles in education and training and developing our healthcare workforce. So the recommendations that are set out there are fivefold, um, as you've seen within the report, but creating that kind of diversity network um, the membership is so important and champions in this work. So the EDI sort of champions within health, health Education England, we work both on a regional and a national footprint, but to work across organisations is really important. A lot of the work I've done with HEE and through my other roles, through reducing the gap and maximising the potential of our diaspora, our international workforce, is really important. So narrowing the gap, maximising the potential, getting them involved more with our research governance, our leadership positions is really important. And making sure that, you know, we're also training our trainers. So the educator development around how we better support our diaspora within the NHS is really important because many times that's the gap. It's not a deficit gap of the individuals who are joining the NHS. It's a deficit of the, the educators probably to how better to support. So a lot of the work I've done over the years is around unconscious bias training, cultural competence, cultural safety, and how we enable and support the individual um, sort of staff members as well. The second recommendation is around improving global health through leadership development and HE have supported this um, over the years, but how can we better improve that programme with consulting with our diaspora and the NHS staff to kind of take forwards that work in countries of their origin as well, to take forwards that work. So the HE International Volunteering Scheme, the Overseas Placement Scheme could support this. Also, reducing the gender leadership gap, that's something I'm very keen on pursuing and how can we better support that? And again, there's programmes through the HE as well as kind of other partnerships through the colleges that we could do to reduce the gender leadership gap and improve our global health outcomes. The third recommendation around capacity building health partnerships, again, the Uganda Alliance work and healthcare capacity building is a really kind of good example of sharing best practice. And I love the report with the case studies, as you said, um, Jacqueline, because the lived experiences is the thing that really touches people's hearts. And sometimes you think, gosh, this still occurs, you know, gosh, after so many decades of work. So those are the things that we need to hear more and then, you know, to put the concrete recommendations into practice. I think that's the kind of the next steps. 
and partnerships to develop, to take forwards. Again, you know, COVID has exacerbated a lot of these issues as we're talking about and the disparities, but how can we use that kind of talent that we have, that staff um, resource that we have to better support our diaspora, but also to take forwards the work as well. And that kind of without a strategic approach. So the report talks about a lot of good practice that happens all already, but how can we join it up and make it work better and a bit more effectively as well? And from the HEE side, we've got the new um, uh, global strategy, which incorporates some of the things and this parallels with some of the things that you've discussed already. So NHS kind of individual development. So putting in sort of steps to make sure that the individuals are developing better, we're attracting, we're promoting diversity, we're re aiming to reduce and get to zero tolerance around racism, around, um, you know, kind of gender equality, making sure these things are being addressed in a proactive way, reducing, eliminating differential attainment. Those things are within our kind of strategic aims both on an individual level, but also on an organizational level as well, and strengthening the sort of the health system partnerships as well. And lastly, just to say around the focus on education. So I think, you know, education is key. We need to still, you know, kind of educate the wider staff to understand these issues, to better support as well, and educating one another, the impact of discrimination bias, you know, kind of, I do so many unconscious bias training, cultural competence, safety workshops, but making sure these things are integral to how we better approach. There's lots of programs that HE are already learning, uh, running around learner programs, um, global health through the International Leadership Development Scheme, Talent for Care, those things. But we could work this across organisations to make a better impact. And whatever we do, we need metrics for success. Unless we have metrics of evaluation, we can't measure our success. We can't measure what we're doing as well. And that better coordination amongst organisations. I think we're all wanting the same goals at the end of it. Um, so working in partnership with our organisations across, um, as well as kind of wider involvement to hopefully meet and reach those objectives and targets that we're setting out. So I hope that's helpful just as kind of um, key principles, as well as some of the thoughts around taking the recommendations forwards. Thank you. Over to you, Francis. Thank you so much for that, Mumtaz. Well, we have two questions, but I want to go to Jackie first to ask her about recommendations. You, She said nothing better than the story. And Jackie also said it was very sobering reading the report. Well, this morning when I was listening to, to Marla, I mean, what she was saying was very sobering too. So Jackie, in terms of the NHS leadership and workforce, what do you think are the key recommendations from this report? Yes, thank you, uh, Francis. And, um, you know, I, I was reminded decades ago as I climbed in my career that with great height comes great responsibility. And no, I'm not referring to Superman, the movie. I'm referring to um, leaders having that huge responsibility. So in recommendation um, two, I was very much struck by the uh, links to health education. Um, England actually consulting with uh, diaspora NHS staff. And I don't think it's just about NHS England. I think it's about every leader, manager, exec team um, in terms of recruiting from overseas, but also welcoming um, guests from overseas as well as the diaspora within our current communities. I don't think that we do well in terms of um, developing people for success. Um, there is something called cultural competency and how one cares for people within our health service in the West that must be taught cannot be assumed. And I think when we assume, we're setting people up for failure. Um, I've engaged with so many people from overseas who, when a woman is in labour, sorry to take this into the maternity space, but when a woman's in labour, they interact very differently in certain countries. We expect a different way of interacting in this country if you are not taught you do not know. I think we spend an awful lot of our time um, teaching people about research and best practice. These are clever people. Our diaspora are clever people. They can read themselves. What they need to be taught is cultural competency, how one um, culturally 
um, provides healthcare within the cultural context of this country. And I really feel quite strongly about that um, from personal experience of supporting diaspora who have ended up um, in difficult situations because nobody taught them. So recommendation two, I've expanded it a little bit, but very much on the education side. I was also very much taken as well by the commendation um, in recommendation three. So thank you to that for um, commending NHS England the improvement on the work that we are doing. Great work, but, but the evidence says that we have so much more to do at pace at pace and intensity. Um, I was also, um, I liked all the recommendations, of course I did, but recommendation four in particular, encouraging the diaspora NHS staff and especially the younger generation to join and actively participate to strengthen the health partnership. And, and I love that, you know, we need to be able to value and respect the younger generation, respect them for who they are and recognize the contribution that they can make to the next three, four, five decades, and then they'll then look to the younger ones to do the same. And equally, recommendation five, I was very much wedded on the needs and the skills of each of the diaspora, and that, that these everybody's needs are different. And it's really, really important then when we're educating our folk, each other, our people, to think about those different needs and meet people where they are at. And that goes back to what I started with. Let's not set each other up to fail. Um, so they're my very quick reflections, Francis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jackie. I want to come into Arul and Susanna for, for you to just give me a quick two minutes, maybe, because I have a couple of questions that I want to put one specifically to Mumtaz and one to the panelists. So, Arul, what are your thoughts around the re recommendation anything specific jumps out for you well i think quite a number i think i agree with uh, jackie's analysis of all the five recommendations i think i'll start by saying the expert report says or recommends enable engage and empower as, as mentioned earlier the word belonging has to come in because the diaspora belongs to the nhs and is integrated to its viability and vibrancy. So unless they feel belong, then they won't be able to act. Hence the NHS staff should be treated equally and opportunities given for training to achieve leadership positions so that they will be inclusive and have the same belong, sense of belonging. Uh, for brevity, I would like to go to the final one, which I say is the report recommends support and aspirations of nurses to give back to their countries of heritage this should be achieved by obtaining grants from the NHS or government of the UK and from philanthropy. And I support the recommendation that we should utilize the diaspora in assessing the need in each heritage country because they can do it better than other people going and assessing. If we want the diaspora to enable, engage and empower, then a policy that encourages strategic contribution of diaspora has to be drawn as the recommendation says. And this should be between the UK government and the low middle income countries, so that the transformation of, uh, including transformation of inclusion agenda. So just to conclude my reading, I support all the recommendations and think it is fantastic. But we have to remember that NHS depends and thrives because of the diaspora, and it's a great opportunity for the same diaspora members and the local NHS staff, not only diaspora staff, but the local UK NHS staff to help improve the global health systems and to promote universal health care by adopting the recommendations of the experts in our midst. So I think uh, the, we had to recognize the contribution by all NHS staff, and we can really ask the people who are local also to contribute to the diaspora agenda. So I'd like to thank you, Francis, for the opportunity. Thank you. You're muted, Francis. Oh, hi. Thank you, Arrow. Susanna, over to you. Two minutes, please. Thank you, Francis, and thank you, everyone. I uh, agree with Arul, and I agree with Jackie and, and Muntat. Um, I, I welcome all the recommendations. I think that uh, this issue of belonging 
is critical and crucial for any diversity, equality, and inclusion agenda because it's not about being part of something with caveats. No, it's about fully being part of something, of this endeavor. And also, uh, remember with health partnerships, what we have is the health sector and the international development sector. And it is about belonging in both. Yes, like diaspora belongs in the health sector and belongs in the international development sector. So for that, recommendation five to me is critical because it's about having really a strategy for participation inclusion at all levels, you know, at all levels from the leadership to any small, any small but high impactful level like we have seen in, in health partnerships taking place. I think then there is all the, that is the critical step um, to, to ensure that that happens and that that is implemented and follow up and follow that. No, just, you know, like as Jackie has said, commitment beyond words, <laughs> you know, like we have to, something has to be uh, act on, uh, whether it is through resources. And I um, Amunta spoke about indicators, uh, evaluating this access. If we really are, are serious about diversity, equality and inclusion strategies, it has to be built within system evaluation strategies. This has to be maybe an indicator that can be included somehow within how uh, healthcare uh, is evaluated and also international development is evaluated. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susanna. Now, Mumtaz, it's your turn, but I want to ask a question because it's specific to you from Agnes Rabotsky. Um, do you think the Medical in Training Initiative has been a useful tool to have conversations around diversity and inclusion? So yes, but again, we could probably be more um, effective in how we use um, that kind of network. So in my college role, uh, Royal College of Physicians, I work as a global vice president, so I oversee the medical training initiative scheme. And what we're trying to do to enable trainees, A, you know, because it's a sort of two-year program where then um, medical sort of trainees would then go back with their experience to their host countries and take back their experience. We're very keen to develop better alumni networks and then support them through international advisors and things so that we could give them those leadership skills to take back their experience to then develop that further. And this is where the networks, you know, your recommendation one comes into play as well, is that how can we better support that network building to translate into practice rather than discussion. Discussion is good and I value that. And I think the sharing experiences is fantastic and needs to be done. But then translating those into recommendations, into actions is what needs to happen. So through the medical training initiative scheme, I saw Louise's question as well around how can we more effectively work with our diaspora colleagues. So the medical training initiative trainees would be one. But other, you know, kind of healthcare professionals within our systems, we do have through HEE a lot of EDI champions and international medical graduate champions and leads within the different regions. So that could be your network where you're collating, you know, best practice as well as kind of getting their thoughts and ideas. And then that could be hopefully put into practice thereafter. So that's some thoughts. Thank you so much. You know, we could have had an hour for this panel discussion, but unfortunately we don't. And I can see Ben um, coming in because it's time for him to introduce the Health Minister of Health. But I want to thank Arul, Jackie, Susanna, and Montaz to say thank you so much for bringing your insight and your very important thoughts. And I hope that all that you've said will be propelled and form part of this dissemination of dissemination and action of the recommendations of this report. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. And on behalf of um, FET as chief exec, may I say that I hear the urgency. So throughout all those um, presentations was that emphasis on the need to get practical. Some of these arguments we've heard before. So I, I hear that very keenly. I would like to pay tribute to Health Education England and to the leadership of Naveena Evans, who provided the foreword. 
Uh, we have a very good partner with HEE who has helped tremendously, um, helped us develop this agenda, and I really look forward to taking that forward. It's my great pleasure, though, to now welcome Minister Jane Hutt, the Minister for Social Justice from the Welsh Government, to this conference. Jane, thank you so much for joining. You're a friend of the Health Partnership Approach, you're a friend of THET, you're a friend indeed of Professor Sir Eldred Parry, our founder, who sends his regards to you. Um, and of course, you're a friend and former patron of our partners at Wales and Africa Health Links Network, and we're really pleased um, to jointly greet you to the conference. Um, we have so much to learn from Wales, um, from your approach to Africa, but also from legislation such as the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And indeed, Jane, from your work to welcome refugees. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and I'd like to say um, it's wonderful to have um, your perspective um, and that of Wales at our conference. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Prinhoun Da, good afternoon. And I'm really pleased to join you today. I mean, I wanted to particularly talk about Wales and our place in the world, uh, but start by talking about how we seek to overcome the challenges of inequality. And some people might think that Wales is too small, too insignificant, too poor even to make a difference to be able to really grapple with that challenge. But I can tell you that it's just not true. Wales has a long and proud history of challenging oppression, of standing up for the disadvantaged and persecuted, and of leading the world in equality and equity. In 1922, the children of Wales were the first to send a wireless message of goodwill to all children in every other country in the world. And we still send those messages today. The women of Wales were the first to send a message of peace from their homes to other homes across the world. The teachers of Wales were the first to teach the principles of the League of Nations in schools. So Wales has always reached out. We've always reached beyond our borders to help, to listen, and most importantly, to learn. And I think that pioneering spirit is still evident in Wales today. Welsh government has been at the forefront um, as you said, Ben, of some innovative, groundbreaking pieces of legislation. So Wales was the first nation in the UK to introduce legislation to end violence against women, domestic abuse and sexual violence. Very, very important uh, in, in today, today. And that act passed in 2015 was a major step towards building a society where everyone can live fear free. Our plan to advance gender equality in Wales, I published in March last year, sets out our ambition and the practical steps needed to advance equality for women and girls. And I'm pleased later this month we'll launch a period dignity strategic action plan, a deliverable plan with further demonstration of our commitment to gender equality, but most importantly informed um, by young people and young, not yet just young women, that young men as well, uh, and all the partners who can make this period dignity plan actually work. Equality, sustainability and fairness are built into what we do. In fact, the Government of Wales Act requires us to mainstream equality in everything we do. And that has to be backed up by policies, strategies, priorities for funding, but crucially, real activity which does make a difference. So we support organisations to run mentoring programmes which provide women and black, Asian and minority ethnic people with the tools and confidence to put themselves forward for, for particularly our, uh, public appointments, diversity and inclusion strategy, uh, which is something we do have some control over. It's set now with that strategy, we're setting out a wide range of initiatives to increase diversity in public appointments where there is uh, a great deal of power and influence. And of course, that's particularly the case in the NHS. Many of the actions we are taking on inequality are set out in our strate strategic equality plan. It also includes our ambition to make Wales the most LGBTQ plus friendly nation in Europe. 
And I want to mention our Action on Disability Framework and a Disability Rights Task Force, which is set up to deal with the disproportionate impact COVID-19 pandemic has had on disabled people. Life doesn't stand still and governments have to keep on developing programmes and providing funding to deal with the issues it throws at us. And equality is woven, as I've said, into the fabric of this government and we will not leave our citizens behind. So you've mentioned already the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, again back in 2015 passed by our Welsh Parliament. And this act means that we have to work with our partners and our communities to improve our environment, our economy, our society and our culture. It means that public bodies have to look to the future. It means that we have to think of our legacy and not just make short term decisions regardless of the long term consequences. But also earlier this year, we enacted the socioeconomic duty. That, that duty in the Equality Act 2010, which has not been enacted um, in, in England, Scotland has also progressed with this, but it does mean now we've enacted it, that public bodies in Wales will have to think about how to protect the most vulnerable people in our society when they're making decisions about the priorities and services they deliver. And these were major milestones for us, but we always are striving for more and we're ambitious to do better in all aspects of life. Last year, our Minister for Health and Social Services signed a memorandum of understanding between the Welsh Government and the World Health Organisation. And this MOU covers really key areas of health equity and rights, investment for health and well-being, and the essential conditions for achieving the highest possible level of health, sustainable development and prosperity for all. And this means that Wales is one of the first nations to pilot and produce its own health equity status report using the approach and methods developed by WHO European Health Equity Status Report Initiative. And I'm sure many of you are aware of this. This agreement will help us continue to reach out beyond our borders to share experiences, learning and resources. But we know that achieving equality is complex. We're not simply looking to eliminate one form of inequality or discrimination. We want to create the conditions for economic, climate, educational, social and cultural equality. And these are big ambitions and rightly so. It's not about dabbling around the edges. We are serious when we say we want to change the world. But sadly, we have witnessed escalations of racism and violence globally. So eradicating racism and promoting race equality, they have always been priorities for the Welsh Government, but we've stepped up our work and commitments to this. And back in March 2020, we committed to develop through co-construction the Race Equality Action Plan for Wales. And this plan is built on the values of anti-racism. It calls for zero tolerance of racism in all its guises. It's been developed collaboratively with our key race stakeholders and the plan is called a plan for an anti-racist Wales. And that's what we want to see. Uh, we have engaged uh, with uh, 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 black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities, professionals, uh, diaspora uh, groups who already engage and inform, with, inform us through the race, uh, race Equality Forum. But we're also committed, and it's part of this, to make Wales a real nation of sanctuary, where people of every race, faith and colour are valued for who they are and for their character and actions. Our, our nation of sanctuary vision is about embedding a societal approach to making Wales not just welcoming to migrants, but a place where we can see and realise the opportunities that migration brings. And I'm so proud that at least 50 Afghan families have been welcomed into Wales this year. And the welcome that refugees have received across Wales gives me great confidence to say that the spirit of the Welsh people is defined by empathy and friendship, not indifference or exclusion. The very feelings of empathy and friendship behind those goodwill messages sent from Wales to the world in the 1920s. Across Wales and the Welsh Government, there's a genuine appetite to do things differently, 
to consider what legacy we want to leave for our children, our grandchildren and the generations that follow them. And Wales is still reaching out beyond its borders, looking beyond our own doorsteps, beyond Europe, like those pioneering women and children I spoke of earlier. Back in 2006, we launched the Wales for Africa programme as a Welsh contribution to what was then the Millennium Development Goals. And over the years, this programme has changed with the times and continues to adapt to new challenges and opportunities. And it significantly is now called the Wales and Africa programme because this better reflects the mutually beneficial nature of the programme. And I was just listening into the previous discussions about reciprocal benefits. Our international strategy published in January uh, of last year set out our ambition to establish Wales as a globally responsible nation. And that's very much part of our Wellbeing of Future Generations Act commitments. It means looking for opportunities to give people the tools to help them out of different times, but again, on that reciprocal basis in terms of the contribution that's being made in, in Wales by our partners. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic is one such example where nations must support each other wherever they can. The pandemic has shown so clearly what an unequal world we live in. We know that in some low and middle income countries, fewer than 1% of the population is vaccinated. And that's contributing to a two track recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Although vaccine distribution is not a devolved area, our First Minister, Mark Drakeford, continues to urge the UK government to accelerate the supply of vaccines to the developing world, in particular to the places we have strong links to Wales, such as Uganda, Namibia and Lesotho. There are some restraints to, as to what devolved administrations are able to do at this time, but that has not stopped us helping where we can. And that's why the Welsh Government made available an extra two and a half million pounds for Welsh organisations to work in partnership with many countries in Africa to fight COVID. And this support has helped African communities to provide basic facilities and equipment to lessen the spread of the virus, to deliver training on how places need to adapt when there are large crowds gathering. And this also helps get children back to school. It's providing clean water and soap stations and essential PPE. It's helping people get digital assistance in areas that couldn't previously provide this so people in remote areas can receive training and advice. And it's through strong, well-established links with organisations in Wales and in Africa that this urgent work to tackle COVID could be done quickly and effectively. And it's this sort of partnership led working, which was again demonstrated by a recent donation of PPE that was sent to Namibia to help deal with their third wave of COVID. The Phoenix Project in Cardiff with the University of Namibia, alongside the Welsh Government and NHS Wales Shared Services Partnership, managed to coordinate the shipment of over £7 million worth of desperately needed PPE, which was no longer needed in Wales. So there's much good work happening to help other countries in their own fights against COVID. But there's always so much more that could be done. Our hands are often tied and there are barriers to jump. But that doesn't stop us continuing to support our friends around the world when it's most needed. And as we move forward, we will ensure that the equality and human rights continue to underpin all that we do. We will ensure equity of access to services. We will tackle inequality. We will seek fairer outcomes for all our citizens. And we will continue to share friendship, learning and resources because that enriches us all. And no one government or nation has all the answers. We must be open to learning from each other if we're to tackle the major issues that still remain in our society. So I wish you well in the remainder of your event. Diochen Val, thank you very much. Jane, thank you very much. One of the great disadvantages of um, having virtual conferences is you can't hear the applause, but I, can you see all the um, love hearts and the hands celebrating your contributions? So I hope you can hear the, um, 
hear the um, the emojis. Thank you so much, and it really is rather inspiring, you know, to have that Welsh perspective. And we realise how busy you are, so thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today on the second day of the Thet Conference. Um, we resume on Monday morning. We have two final mornings of the conference to come, and I'm really pleased that we have Elizabeth Iro, who's the Chief Nursing Officer at WHO, and we have Dr. Tadesse, who's the Minister of Health in Ethiopia, speaking alongside people such as Professor Jed Byrne from HEE um, and Judith Ellis. And those of you who don't know, but Judith has served six years as Chair of Trustees of THET. We're very much in her debt. Um, and this is her final um, year as chair. And so we're, 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 we're giving her the stage to conclude the um, conference on Tuesday. But sincere thanks to you all um, for engaging. I've been able to loop back and see some of the sessions that I wasn't able to attend live. And I think that's been a colossal advantage of, of having a virtual event as has the fact that we're joined by so many people from low middle income countries. I think it's about 40% of delegates. So do enjoy rummaging around and um, looking at sessions that you might have missed. Today for me has been sobering as someone said earlier, I think um, in so many ways, because we've confronted those challenges, those realities of racism and inequality in particular. But it's also been inspirational to be surrounded once again, as we are at FET conferences, by the most brilliant, um, talented, well-intentioned people that are part of this health partnership community. So thank you all very much for the time you've invested joining the conference. And I very much look forward to seeing you on Monday morning.